Hello everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday video kindly sponsored by Skillshare. You've probably seen or heard of them before, but just in case you haven't, Skillshare is an online learning community which contains a wide variety of skill improving classes that everyone can benefit from. If you want to learn a new skill, advance an existing one, or just see how other people happen to make things work, there'll be a video for you. Uh, for fellow naval enthusiasts, such as myself, there are topics like illustration, photography, film and video, and many others. So whether you want to draw ships, photograph ships, or make videos about ships, there are tips, tricks, and techniques to discover. This month, instead of trying to upgrade existing skills, I've been trying to learn a couple of new ones, one of which is this course by Chris Scaff on animating 2D artwork, because, well, we've got plenty of photos from World War I and World War II, but when it comes to older battles, Age of Sail battles, there's only a few paintings and, of course, no video, so I thought I'd give it a shot at trying to make it look a little bit more exciting. And the other thing I've been working on is trying to figure out how to get a 3D print to work properly. Because I've had a 3D printer for a while, as you might guess, but recently, let's just say HMS Thunderchild is planning to leave the dry dock at some point, and I don't want it to go horribly wrong. And so Brandon Gibbs' course on that is perfect. There are no ads on the site, and if you want to go and have a look and see perhaps if there's something that you could make use of, the first thousand of you that click on the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. So once again, thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And now, on with the show. Hello everybody, welcome to another Wednesday video. Now, as long-term viewers might be aware, way back in the dark, deep mysteries of the channel's early history, there were a few videos on the King George V class battleships, but never anything in any particular great length or in any particular great detail, at least by the standards of what the channel's turned into. However, we are in luck because we have with us today a special guest, Matt Warwick, who is going to educate us all on some of the finer details of the King George V class and also burst a few of the uh, myths and misconceptions that have grown up around it. So with that said, let's go over to our brilliant guest speaker to introduce himself. Hello, uh, thanks very much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, unlike some other of your guests, I can't claim any books or any particularly mm -hmm. illustrious uh, history, but I have spent quite a lot of my recent time delving into this class to try and understand, you know, why are they well, built the way they are? Um, and I'm looking forward to going in depth this evening. Awesome. So for those of you who haven't seen this format before, basically I have approximately 10 questions which will be asked and um, our guest speaker, our expert, will give us most of the details, which is great for me because I don't have to say a lot. <laughs> so I guess we'll, we'll lead in with question the first. Now, obviously, the King George V are developed during the 1930s. They're the first British treaty battleships to actually be built. Um, at the time that they're actually being designed, you could, by treaty, have a ship with 16-inch guns. But the only serious early design options that I've certainly come across were ones that either used three triple 15-inch guns, which was a very early study, and thereafter various flavours of 14-inch guns and eventually settling on the three quad 14s before some final design revisions. So why was there no 16-inch design when they technically could have? So... I was thinking of the best way of sort of trying to explain sort of why the 14 and 15 inch design sort of dominate um, the history of the class. And I thought that maybe the, the easiest thing to do would be to go all the way back to actually 1929 when it was, um, there were 16 inch designs seriously considered. If we look at the first design, that we go to 1929, um, I just find it's a very interesting contrast uh, with what the King George the Fifth have become. So, you know, we've got 16-inch guns in twin turrets, nothing extravagant like the quadruples. We've got a split secondary battery that persists for quite a long time in British designs. It's slow, um, and it has internal inclined belt armour, um, which, again, the King George the Fifth are quite well known for not having. 
And so to try and trace how the Royal Navy gets from something that looks like this to something that looks like the King George V is, um, in my view, a rather interesting process. I think it's quite interesting to jump to the 1933 staff requirements because that's when we start seeing what will become the King George V emerge. Um, and in particular, it's the question of speed and size. So the hope at this point is still that there'll be a further reduction in tonnage. So the Royal Navy won't have to replace its 15 capital ships like for like with 35,000 tonners. It might be able to get maybe 28,000, um, 25,000 if it's lucky. So it's sort of drawing up its initial requirements for what become the King George V and looking around um, at what Japan are doing or thinking and saying, what the French are doing and saying, what the Germans are doing and saying. And the particular thing to note here is that but, you know, we've got fast ships. Um, France is building Dunkirks and the Germans are building their Deutschlands. Um, both these are in the high 20s of knots. And so, so there's a consideration there about speed. But then in regards to main armament, you have to sort of remember how rare guns bigger than 14 inch were outside essentially the Royal Navy. The USA had three 16 inch ships. Japan had two. The rest of those main battle fleets had 14 inch. Um, the Germans brand new ships were with 11 inch and the French with 13 inch. So there isn't in 1933, this great drive to build 15, 16 inch guns. And so they start thinking a bit more about, you know, what kind of ship they need. So they still like the four twin turrets here. You know, they've been put off triples by the Nelsons. Um, and they reckon they can get more from eight tw uh, four twins than they can from three triples. At this stage, they're also still thinking that a secondary battery that's separate from the anti-aircraft armament um, is the way to go. Uh, they, they think that the requirements for the secondary battery um, just make having a combined one sort of suboptimal. So they want six inch guns for the anti-surface work. They're also still not sure what caliber the anti-FF armor is going to be. So, you know, they specify six guns, but they sort of leave open the caliber question to later. It might be 4.7 inch for the bigger shell. They might want four inch for the higher rate of fire. But they do want at least four pom-poms and as many as eight multiple machine guns. Um, although they are willing to sort of slightly go back on that if it's impossible to fit. Mm -hmm. Also at this point, they're still looking at torpedo tubes. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is interesting. You know, every British battleship since like the 1890s has torpedo tubes and the staff requirements are no different. But now they're above water tubes and they want quintuple mountings, one either side. So you look at the King George the Fifth a few years later with no torpedo tubes, um, and it's quite an interesting contrast to what they were saying just a few years earlier. Obviously, trying to design armour protection is sort of depends on the, what attack you're going to face. So ideally, you know, if the limit's 35,000 tonnes, they want the ship to be able to stand up against 16-inch shell fire. Um, although machinery spaces, as set by the Nelsons, um, can be a little bit reduced. And even in 1933, you see here 1,000 pound terminal velocity dive bomb attack. Um, so they are starting to show awareness of these sort of new forms of threat. They want to jump up with their underwater protection to about 1,000 pound charge, but speed, they're still happy with 23 knots. They still think that the battle fleets of Japan and the United States are going to be in the low 20s, and therefore they don't need to exceed that. But their initial sort of approaches to a ship of this sort of requirements was 32,000 tons or more. And that wasn't really satisfying the desire to step down seriously. But why did they think, you know, they could step down? Because looking back in hindsight, it seems like, you know, it's hard to understand why they were suddenly looking at 12 inch gun ships or 14 inch at best. But, you know, this was a meeting held by the First Sea Lord on the 10th of January, 1934, when they were discussing this. And there was, you know, these five factors were written 
down as the what would govern the situation. And the UK was proposing 25,000 tons of 12 inch guns, um, or alternatively, a ship with 22,000 tons of 11 inch guns, which seems absolutely teeny tiny. <laughs> but they thought that was the minimum required. Japan apparently made a proposal for a ship of 25,000 tons of 14 inch guns. They knew the Americans wished to keep the current standards, but they're also aware that the French had just laid down a ship that was, as far as they were concerned, about 23,000 tons with 13 inch and a bit guns. Um, and they also knew that the Germans wanted to build something larger than Deutschland, but not necessarily the full sort of 35,000 ton battleship. So during this discussion, they thought that they might be able to convince the Americans to go down to about 28,000 tons. And so that prompted in early 1934, a big and extensive look at what could you do with 28,000 tons and 12 inch guns. So you get a whole series of design studies and, you know, I've put up most of them here and it's still interesting to just to see when certain design features sort of kick in. Um, the first couple keep the quintuple torpedo tubes, but they, they quickly drop that idea. Aircraft as well start off maybe one at most on a turret, but by the end of the design series, opinion has shifted and you start seeing the four that will sort of define the later designs. Turrets are still almost exclusively, you know, twins or triples and speeds are still, you know, 23 knots is fine. And it's only when you get to design 12R that you suddenly start seeing a dual purpose secondary armament, which isn't necessarily wanted, but it's accepted. Um, the concern is that by trying to stick in 12 six inch guns, 12 4.7 inch guns, four pom poms and eight quadruple machine guns, that's a lot of gun arcs you're trying to arrange in a very cramped space on a 28,000 ton ship. You know, trying to get all these guns so they're clear of blast and you can supply them with ammunition effectively. Um, it was challenging. Uh, and another point actually raised is that this was a lot of crew who were exposed and vulnerable. Um, and therefore, you know, if a shell was to land amongst these guns, you'd have horrific casualties. Uh, and so the future First Sea Lord Roger Backhouse was like, you know, I'm quite happy to give up this six in secondary battery. Um, granted at this point they thought they could fit 24 4.7 inch guns uh, later experience would show they could only get about 20 on the torpedoes make a comeback yeah, yeah they do um, and even greater numbers where they start thinking let's have two triple mounts each side um, interestingly they that triple mount idea comes back in the 1940s for the King George V <laughs> uh, slightly getting ahead of myself there but when they remove the aircraft catapult, um, they do consider, we could put torpedoes here. <laughs> and, yeah, the, the conclusion, obviously, that we don't need to put torpedoes on our battleships in 1943, but they, they did consider it. They decided, actually, more anti-aircraft guns was probably the way to go. <laughs> yeah, probably someone had watched Bismarck versus Rodney and decided maybe a few more torpedoes might have been useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was strange. There's no mention of why they thought it was a good idea they're just like well we've sort of always put torpedoes on our battleships and this occasion we haven't but maybe now we can <laughs> fair enough um but then you move on from sort of 1934 and suddenly you start seeing the 14 inch gun dominate designs the reason for this seems to be um an approach or discuss with the americans so the americans share some design weights they've got of 14 inch battleships and so the Royal Navy starts thinking well what could we do for a 14 inch battleship they come up with two requirements you have design A which is the if we've got 35,000 tons what can we do with it um, doesn't have to be the full 35,000 tons but if we're trying to build a genuine balanced 12 times 14 inch gun battleship this is what we want and then design b is the if we pare it down to the minimum to try and get as close as we can to these requirements on a smaller displacement you know what can we achieve 
And it's interesting, I think, to see where they make the sacrifices. And the sacrifices are in firepower. They're happy to give up a triple turret um, to save displacement. They slightly pare back the secondary armament, um, and they can give up the torpedo tubes if they must. But the anti-aircraft armament needs to stay the same, and the armor protection needs to stay the same. Um, so they go, all right, we've got these. What can we do with them? And they come up with these two designs here on the left, one of 34,000 tons, and then the paired back one is 30,000 tons. So they take these, they look at their weights, they look at the US designs, and they've only got like the weight breakdown. And it's also obviously slightly misleading because the way the British characterize or categorize weights and the way the Americans categorize weights are different. Um, but they're sort of aware of this and they have a conversation about, you know, different approaches. And ultimately what they're trying to do is convince the Americans that they don't need 35,000 tons or even necessarily 32,500 tons. Um, so they start trying to shrink down their design A to the 32,500 ton figure as at least a stepping stone towards arms reduction. And what makes this interesting is obviously not only is this the first series where we see a 14 inch gun appear in the 1930s, but we also get the quad turret. And what's interesting about that is that they think that they can save about 1,200 tons um, on design A, just by going down to three quads rather than four triples. Yeah, so, so you, you, you can see there with the 14 TLAX compared to 14 Q. Yeah, and it's the same, it, it, it's roughly it, it, the same displacement, but they've brought torpedoes back and bumped the armor up a bit compared to the triple turret layout, and got two two extra knots as well. Yeah, so when they look at it, they sort of see right, how can we bring TLA down? And they've got two approaches. One is to keep you know, the X essentially gives up two knots. You know, we don't need twenty three. Twenty one's been fine for decades. We'll go back to twenty one. And they do have to reduce some of the armor over the machinery. They have to get rid of torpedo tubes. Um, but mostly the machinery weight suffices. And then approach Y is we want to keep the 23 knots, but that means they need to give up more in the way of armor. And then they look at the quad turrets and realize that they can basically have A for the same displacement plus a bit. Um, so they, they start becoming quite enamored with the weight savings that Quad Turret offers. And now this slide I've shown you is quite a wall of text, but I just thought it was quite interesting to see what they're thinking of in early 1935 when it comes to um, the designs. What are they actually trying to achieve? And so the first sort of point I thought worth mentioning is that when you look at armament weight, if you exclude the 9 14 inch one as sort of being too small, the 9 15 inch is actually the lightest compared to having 9 16 inch or 12 14 inch. So when you're on a fixed displacement, clearly that means if you're going for 9 15 inch over 12 14 inch, you've actually got more tonnage to put into um, machinery and armor. And I don't think that's always quite realized. It's easy to just go, well, 14 inch guns are smaller. Um, but actually by weight at least, the 15 inch option is the lightest armament weight. Yeah, well, I suppose you're adding three extra three extra guns to the equation and all the sp extra space you need in the turrets which means the turret armor is going to go up in weight as well so it, it's all yeah. going to add up mm. yeah it, it all adds up um and and so i just sort of thought it was worth noting because in a minute we'll get on to when they start comparing various 12 inch you know, 14 inch designs with 15 inch designs and realizing that actually the 15 inch one by some standards is the least firepower heavy um, so then we have shattering effect, um, and these are all direct quotes from documents at the time. And I just thought it was interesting because it does talk about the value of shattering um, the sort of soft parts of the ship. You know, you don't necessarily, there's going to be times when neither ship can penetrate the other's vitals. So it is important that you can, you know, destroy the soft bits and reduce the other ship's combat power that way. 
Um, and there is a debate there whether or not you try and do that with more guns. You know, is it more important to hit in the first place? Or do you want to make sure your hits have somewhat more of an impact? You know, the 16-inch has 50% more explosive power in these considerations than the 14-inch, which is clearly hugely significant. But at the same time, the 14-inch, in theory, hits a third more often because it's got a third more guns. Moving on to the speed question, you're, it's often asked, you know, why did the King George V end up with a speed of, you know, 28 knots or so? Uh, and the answer is that, obviously, they preferred 23 at the start, and then the Europeans sort of messed all that up by deciding they needed these 30-knot ships. So they go, all right, we'll have a look at some 30-knot designs. Uh, and the Royal Navy's like, well, all right, we've got these, but they look a bit firepower heavy. What if we just reduce the speed slightly, you know, go for something in the middle? Um, because the important point is not the absolute speed you can achieve. It's the speed you've got relative to the opponent. And if they can only do three knots more than you, well, how often is that going to make a decisive difference? And what I like about this is it sort of shows quite a lot of foresight towards things like the Bismarck chase. Um, you know, it suggested that a small difference in maximum speed would have but little effect in the plane of strategy. Here again, other factors such as the position of basis, intelligence, reconnaissance, and the disposition of our forces may well outweigh the practical effect of a margin of, say, three knots on one side. And you just sort of see you know, how they're trying to balance these factors in their ship design. And then on the right here, it's just two schools which are schools of thought that are in the navy at the time you've got the decisive range school and the gunpowder school now the gunpowder school is all about gunpowder unsurprisingly and it's essentially i think the school that the old battle cruiser captains would have been a big fan of it's definitely where jackie fisher uh, would have belonged and this was all about stop trying to keep up with the increased hitting power of the shell double down on firepower um, and essentially yeah, defend by offence. Just secure your magazines best you can against enemy hits and put the rest of your weight into firepower and just, you know, hit them first. Take them down before they have a chance to do too much damage to you. They also make the point in the gunpowder school that armour tends to stand up better in practice than it does in the testing grounds which, as it notes here, that's a matter of opinion. Um, and it is pointed out that the ships that have withstood attack in action, uh, mainly the Queen Elizabeth class, did so under a bleak fire, which doesn't really tell anything about broadside on. No. Well, I suppose the number of actual full-on broadside engagements is relatively small, because even when you have the fleet steaming in relative parallel to each other, there's usually someone or other who's got a slight lead, which turns it into a bit of an oblique angle firing sequence. Yeah. Um, so you can sort of see slightly where they're coming from, but I think when you sort of look at the decisive range score, you quickly realise which one won. And this is all about the need for capital ships to have sufficient armour that they can get into decisive range, as it says here, to enable them to have a reasonable chance of taking that armament to effective range and ultimately decisive. It's they don't want to risk losing a ship to single hits or taking extravagant damage early on. Um, they don't mind having slightly less firepower. They want to make sure that firepower can get to where it can do the most damage. And for the Royal Navy, that's under 16,000 yards. And it comes up again and again. They sort of go, well, it's all well and good that we've got these fancy fire control instruments and we've got these aircraft. And yeah, we maybe can hit at 25, 30,000 yards. But in an action, are we going to be able to depend on that? Um, and they sort of go, well, no, you know, these instruments might be damaged. You might not have aircraft available. You know, the smoke of battle might obscure um, the target. You might have to take your ship down to 15,000 yards if you want to hit them. Um, and therefore, ships should be built so that they can get there reliably. Interesting. Yeah, because I suppose at that point, you're, you're almost having to build a ship more for brawling than than for sniping yeah. and and it might I mean it makes sense because even if you do have brilliant fire control systems it, 
with at any level of firearms technology, the longer range shots, if you're just relying on the ballistics of the gun and directing the gun barrel rather than any kind of guided munition, it's just a simple fact. Statistically, the longer you, fu you fire from the more there's going to be deviation and the more there's going to be a chance for a miss. You get up close and personal, it's very difficult to miss. Yeah. Um, and the other factor, of course, is that the Royal Navy wants a decisive battle. You know, it had quite enough of un, you know, indecisive engagements <laughs> during the First World War where it just fired off ammunition at long ranges. You know, if it's in action, it wants to force a result. Um, and that means hitting, and that means ships that can get in close not, you know, we're not talking ridiculously close by the standards of these things, but 15, 16,000 yards. And then I suppose we come to really what your question was asking and why no 16 inch designs? Um, and the answer is there were a couple of them. They did look at 16 inch ships in 1935. Um, I've got 12 here. This isn't all of them, there are others. And this is just a series of design studies where they just essentially look at 23 knot ships, they look at 27, they look at 30 knots, they look at a couple in between, they have all sorts of armament combinations, um, you know, one quad, two twins in 14D for an eight gun ship. And just to try and work out, you know, how they compare to each other, how much weight needs to go into armament, how much into firepower, what these ships would do you know against each other there's a lot of one-to-one -one comparisons to sort of evaluate effective ranges um so you do you know, your 16a which is a 30 knot 16 inch design and they look at that armor protection and go uh no thank you that's <laughs> terrifying yeah um they're, they're very unimpressed by that and they look at the 27 knot 16b and they go we don't want to have mixed turrets they don't like a mix of odd and even numbered turrets. So they go, no, we won't really consider that one. And you've got 16C, which is probably the strongest of them, where they go, all right, we'll have three triples, 16 inch guns, 27 knots. Um, but it's armor still a little bit on the weak side. You know, we're not happy with that. Ultimately, you know, the favor and the one that crops up quite often in online discussions is 15C, which is the 29 and a half knot. 15 inch guns, one with a belt nearly as thick as what's on the King George V. Uh, and it is a strong design, and the Royal Navy like it. Um, it is, should, should be emphasized, a design study. It is very high level. There's not an actual <laughs> ship behind it yet. Yeah. But they do look at it at this stage and go, yeah, we like that. Um, and then in the top right here, I have just included the sort of weight for one inch of armor. Um, that underpin some of these decisions, just to show you how much more went into decks than into belts. For, and because I find it quite drastic, you know, one inch on your magazines on decks, 420 tons, whereas increasing your machinery armor by an inch on the belt, 80, gives us sort of an indication of, you know, how much weight these decks were absorbing. Yeah, and I suppose that's very important because obviously the deck armor is notionally there to protect you against plunging fire at long range if you ever end up experiencing that but by the time that these ships are being designed they're also having to think quite seriously about protection against bombs so the deck armor costs a lot but it's it's protecting against two separate threats whereas the best that your belt armor is ever going to protect you against bombs is maybe it stops splinters from near misses yeah uh, and that comes up again and again it's you sort of see them talking about deck armor and it's not often they really care about shell fire. The requirements are dictated by bombs and what they need against those. Uh, and it just so happens to mean that the thicknesses required to that mean that you're pretty immune to plunging fire at the ranges in question. So generally, they want the dirt karma for bombs. And that actually drives quite a lot of decision making process later on um, when we look at the deck karma in more detail. So I thought, you know, this is just a quick set of conclusions they had based on the three different speeds and you can sort of see they like the 15 inch gun you know for the 30 knot ship the 15 inch gun means they can have a lot better protection and for when you're standing a 15 inch ship in the line against ships of 16 inch guns that's go well actually it's better to have 
the slightly lesser arm ship because her armor will stand up a lot better. So if we're going to do a 30 knot ship, we want to do a 15 inch, you know, have 15 inch guns. And they sort of carry on the same conclusion down to the 27 knot ship. It's not quite as clear cut, but they still think that if they're going to be standing in the line against 16 inch fire, the 15 inch gun is better, there's more armor. And you'll note it also says, and against aircraft. So even here, they're expecting aircraft to play a significant role in the design. And then finally, for a 23 knot ship, they basically go, what's the point in anything but 16 inch guns? Because we can <laughs> adequately, uh, adequately protect <laughs> any sort of ship in question, be it 9, 16 inch, 12, 14 inch. So there's not really much to gain by having the 15 inch armament. Fair enough, yeah. So at that point, you've dropped so much machinery, you're saving so much weight, you can just start slathering on the, the, the belt and deck <laughs> armor like you just know tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, you sort of go, well, we can do something like Nelson with an ordinary arrangement and we've got a thousand tons we can take off the machinery weights to put into more armour. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't need to worry about having a 15-inch gun. What was interesting, though, is how they did actually think the 14-inch ship at this stage was worth considering over the 15-inch because it has more guns. As it sort of says here, and I was alluding to a minute ago, you know, it may expect to obtain four hits to three just because of its more barrels. Mm -hmm. And some do say that the hit is the important factor. And it just matters where that hit is. The size of the hit doesn't matter. Okay. But then they also say, you know, the difference might not be great, but the advantage of the 16 inch are more concrete. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. So, yeah, if you, you hit someone with a 16-inch, they're going to feel it wherever it hits. You hit someone with a 14-inch, they may or may not feel it. But then, as you say, the counter-argument, well, you might hit them a lot more often with the 14-inch, so it's kind of a roll of the dice of how, if we yeah. hit them slightly more often, will we eventually, by statistics, get lucky enough to hit something that really hurts? <laughs> yeah. So at this stage, you're looking at, you know, if they were going to build a 23-knot ship, it would have 16-inch guns, ignoring treaties, on 35,000 tons. But if they're going to build a fast ship, it will have 15-inch. This is where sometimes you get lots of debate about how the UK had, was going to build 15-inch gunships, and then the treaty happened. And I think what need, need, we need to be clear about, there was a three-week period where the Admiralty was like, investigate the 15-inch gunship. Um, very quickly, you know, it's here, the date's 20 September 1935, they decided that they should have nine 15-inch guns and 29 knots to match European construction. Three weeks later, they switched to 12 14-inch guns and 28 knots. And so that is driven, essentially, by the Americans, who, having spent years going, no, we're not going smaller, absolutely not, no way. Go, well, actually we can do 14 inch still on 35,000 tons but we can do 14 inch and, and the issue, the idea of the displacement limit going down was killed by the italians essentially the moment they went actually we're not going to build something like dunkirk we want a 35,000 ton ship mm -hmm. with 15 inch guns and then the french were like well we're not going to go smaller than that are we now and then the germans jump in and go well we're not going to be smaller than that it's like years of work to get to smaller guns and ships Gone. Gone, yeah. Meanwhile, the um, Japanese are quietly drawing up sketch plans for the Yamato. Yeah. But what's funny actually on about the Japanese is even at this stage, the Brits still think that actually Japan wants to go smaller. They sort of look back at that 25,000 ton, 14 inch gun proposal and they're going, well, we think the Japanese would go smaller if we could get the Americans to go smaller. Which obviously clearly <laughs> changes. Yeah. The Japanese um, are sitting there going, yes, everyone, please build build smaller, less well-protected battleships. Please do this. <laughs> yeah, it's just an interesting sort of look at how they're thinking. Um, and I just think the choice at the end, bottom there sort of encapsulates the thoughts at the end of 1935 in the Admiralty. You know, if we're going to build a battle cruiser, which we have to do because the Europeans are, we have to assume that the Americans and the Japanese will build 16-inch ships. So even if you only limit in a new treaty two ships 
to 15, 16 inch, and then you, everyone goes to 14 inch, then you still got 16 inch ships of new construction in Japan that you can't match. Or option B, which is the one they went for, is to insist on 14 inch for all future building. Um, and it just means they thought they might have to accept a possible inferiority in their battle cruisers at the time. Yeah, and I suppose a no note for the viewers, um, when the Admiralty is talking about battle cruisers here, they're not talking about, you know, invincible or lion class designs. They're still operating by the slightly odd convention the Royal Navy had in the 1930s that anything faster than 25 knots was a battle cruiser, regardless of what you actually fitted it with, to yeah. the degree that, as I've mentioned before on the channel, you have this wonderful description of HMS Vanguard as the fully armoured battle cruiser <laughs> in some of the early designs. Yeah, and the King George V studies their new battle cruiser through to about mid-1936, and then they become the new capital ship when they start looking at all the armour they're throwing at this thing and going, um, maybe this term doesn't really apply very well. Yeah. And also, I think when you're everyone's building fast capital ships, you just realise you've actually, a capital ship has to be fast these days. It's not, battle, you know, the 23, 21 knot battleship is obsolete. And you need to build fast ships. Mm -hmm. So the distinction somewhat goes away. So that takes us up essentially until the 14 inches um, decided upon. Which I think is a roundabout way of answering your first question. Yes. <laughs> 15 inch designs. Yeah. Yes eventually but they weren't ever really looked at because by the time they get to looking at ships that can take 16 inch guns they need fast ships and they don't like fast 16 inch ships yeah they, they don't like them being very poorly protected so yeah i mean it makes sense there there's a limited limited amount you can put on those five thousand tons i mean you see the same kind of decision making processes going on with things like heavy cruisers across the board where people are they're wedded to the idea of having eight inch guns and a lot of them they're wedded to the idea of having high speed and then if you're the japanese navy and that means you have to put one inch of basically splinter armor on your turrets well so be it whereas yeah. obviously the british have kind of looked at it and gone hmm yes thinly protected capital ships i think we won't do this one again <laughs> yeah and they do reference these 16 inch 30 knot ships going basically we'd be doing the counties just on a bigger scale <laughs> Are we sure we want to do that? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so I guess that, that brings us on to question two. So they've selected this three quad designs with 12, 14 inch guns. Then, you know, the, the, we're approaching by this point pretty much, we're almost on top of the point where they're actually laying these ships down, but they come out the other end with a twin turret in B position. So what's going on? What? Why does B turret lose two of its guns pretty much at the last moment so essentially they obviously they spent months or years looking at the quad going you know 12 14 inch guns compared to 9 15 inch that's acceptable but then they make a couple of changes to the sort of core design um that they don't want to give up but they do cost a lot of weight uh and that is principally the raising of the armored deck from middle deck level to main deck so that obviously moves behind the ship, you need more belt armour, etc, etc. Um, that adds weight, and they also switch from the 4.5 inch secondary gun to the 5.25 inch. Um, there's a few other changes as well, but those are probably the two big ones. And so you can see here on this slide, you go design 14N to design 14O. And they don't like 14O much at all. So this is got the raised armour deck, which they really like. It's got the new 5.25 inch gun, which they really like. But it does mean that the belt armour to essentially go from the middle deck to the main deck has to be rather thin. So, you know, you see that the upper belt there, magazines, 13 inch, machinery, 12 inch. They do not like this. Um, likewise, when they've had to shave half an inch off the deck armour, um, that sort of takes it below what they're comfortable with. So they're sort of looking at this design and going, we really like these improvements we've just made, um, but we can't accept this armor, can we? <laughs> you know, it's just not comfortable. Um, 
And so you see there design 14P, which essentially becomes KG5 as laid down. And by dropping two of the guns, the armor shoots up. You know, the belt goes from 13 and 14 to 15, and the machinery gets from a 12 or 13 inch belt to a flat 14. Um, and the deck armor is recovered. So you can kind of see the gain in protection um, giving up the two guns. It yeah. does have a lot of debate around it, though. Um, and again, this is where we get back to the whole decisive range school or gun power school. And so they're sort of looking at it going, you know, the ships need to be able to operate when and where they're required, you know, even in the face of strong air attack. And again, this is referencing the deck armor. They don't like the thinner deck because of bombs. They need to have security against shellfire to get to below 16,000 yards and to make the most of the national characteristics of our personnel. <laughs> Um, something that comes up occasionally. The Royal Navy is very uh, impressed by its own long service system and its traditions and history, and it doesn't like chance. It wants to give itself the best chance of winning. So it needs that. But they also do need to be able to match these European 15-inch ships. Um, although, again, they note that matching ship for ship might be misleading. You know, There's more to naval strategy than my battleship's bigger than your battleship. Um, cough, cough, Germany. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, other arms of the fleet, including air, have to play their part. And then again, air attack for the fourth point. The ship is required for European waters, where she may be frequently subjected to air attack at sea or in harbour. And she needs to have the ability to fight at medium and short ranges because the weather conditions might mean you might not see an enemy till 20,000 yards. So you can sort of see where they're coming from. And the conclusion is that the requirements of armour are absolute. You know, it doesn't matter how fast or slow the ship is, it's always important that they have the minimum standard of armour. Not least because armour is mostly fixed. You know, They can improve the striking power in the future by shell development, um, but you're not really going to be replacing the belt armour halfway through a ship's life. So they go, right, we need to do more than just have the minimum required standards for today because these ships might be still here in 20 years and the attack won't still be as it is today. On the contrary, they go, well, if we drop down to a twin in B position, then that will delay the ships by probably nine months. And so I sort of included this passage here because... You know, the delay in the completion of the ships from the spring of 1940 to the end of that year, though undesirable, is unlikely to be vital unless we happen to go to war during that particular <laughs> year. And you do sort of look at that and wince a bit inside. Um, but on the other hand, our first seven ships, in any case, would be completed by the end of 1942. Um, in other words, to get the best design was more important than the delay. And you can see the argument from the perspective of 1935, at least. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's just slightly ironic. They're think they're thinking in terms of long long term fleet strategy rather than at, the, at that point. Obviously, they, they don't really. No one appreciates they're going to be at war in four years time. Yeah, yeah. They they want to make sure they get the right ships <clears throat> and ships. And again, the air power thing comes up all the time. Um, you know, even Chatfield in nineteen thirty four. I was reading this document. You know, if they have to sacrifice other parts of the ship design to make sure the ship can operate under air attack, they will do so. You know, that is a vital requirement, even with 1934 biplanes, um, which I find quite interesting. You know, you get all this thing about battleship admirals and bits and pieces, but the air attack is always at the forefront of these designs. Um, so that essentially takes us through, you know, mm. to why the ships have 10 guns. Yeah. And then my next sort of set of slides is moving on to design choices and to go into a bit more detail about why the Navy did what they did. Yeah, so that's, that really fits with the questions. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of question three, isn't it? So what what are the... So we know now why why they've got the 14-inch guns, why they've gone down to 10 guns. So that's your kind of your offensive fire uh, systems taken care of, at least for yeah. the surface actions. But then you've got the defensive systems where the enemy's chucking shells and torpedoes back at you and you know getting the ability to move around. So what are the main reasons then for the choices behind 
the defensive systems, armor, torpedo defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, well, there's a few interesting things um, because it's you know it gets talked about a lot. You know, vertical slab armor, you know, rubbish slabs. I, I see it all the time. It sort of drives me nuts. Um, you have to remember, you know, the Navy did adopt inclined armor on the Nelsons. It had inclined armor internally on its 1929 designs. So why did it decide that actually for the King George V will go vertical? Um, so yeah, you can see here the progression. You know, Nelson, you've got quite a narrow belt, but it's inclined mm -hmm. and it's internal. And then that evolves somewhat by the time you get to 1929 where they add a lower belt. Um, the thicknesses here on the belt are a bit thinner because they've gone to four twins. And so there's less weight for protection. Um, not quite so efficient, but they do increase the incline. But they go, right, we've got to protect against diving shells, so we'll stick in a four-inch lower belt. Looks somewhat similar to what we find on the South Dakotas, in my opinion, um, and the Iowa's. You know, it's that same kind of big, thick upper belt and then the lower belt um, to protect below. But they move away from that. They don't actually like that when they think about it some more. So in 1933, um, they're still looking at 12-inch designs at this stage, but they start trying to work out how they can combine the torpedo defense system they've just developed, the sort of sandwich one, with the belt armor. And so the first option they look at is this option on the left, where they go, right, we've got a inclined belt. Um, we've got a small lower belt to protect against diving shells, and we can sort of get our sandwich system to work. But they don't really like that very much because it's a bit awkward. Um, it needs a wider ship. It needs 106 feet of beam, and that means more deck armor. Um, and they don't really like having the incline. Um, they, like, they don't like having these voids outboard of the belt armor that can be easily pierced. And they don't like having this three inch lower belt because they worry that if it's hit by a torpedo, um, it will blast these splinters into the ship. Which, incidentally, is what happens to Indomitable in the Mediterranean in 1943. Mm. Um, they want to avoid that. So they come up with option B, which is the vertical armor we sort of know. It means it's a narrower ship, um, which is better for docking, less deck armor, maybe slightly faster for the same length. Um, it does require a thicker belt, and they acknowledge this. You know, They'll need more weight in the belt. But they think the advantage of that, you know, offset, needing that extra weight. So in about October, you know, they sit down and choose option B. They also don't like the internal belt because when it gets to the end of the ships, they think it will have to be taken to the edge anyway. So it's difficult to work. Um, you get these sort of voids that are easily flooded. It doesn't mean you need a wider ship more deck. It just becomes quite difficult and they're not convinced that saving an inch in thickness is really worth it um, but they do slightly make the actual main belt slightly deeper so you see on the left they've got a 10 feet sort of above the waterline bit then there's the eight feet thickness below and then there's a little six feet three inch bit they get rid of the three inch bit um, that's just a danger but they managed to slightly increase the height of the overall vertical slab which is interesting because at that point the uh, there's almost as much armor underwater than as there is above water. So they're clearly they've clearly appreciated the results of things like the Emperor of India test trials, which showed that shells could dive underwater. Yeah, they're very conscious of that. Um, that they want to maximize protection, um, but they also don't want to leave bits of metal that can act as bullets if hit by a torpedo. So it's Quite the compromise and they also find that if they mount the belt externally it provides more of an umbrella shading effect so it's less likely for a shell to get under it so they make the decision and what surprised me is sort of how early that was you know that was you know, october 33 um and that's that that's the decision made that's not revisited and then this again is just sort of comparing option b we just looked at with the final king george the fifth design um, and you can sort of see the similarities. The vertical belt is still there. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the thicknesses because the 1933 options were for 12-inch ships. Um, 
but you can see how in the actual final King Joseph design, they decided to taper the lower belt because of the reduced need underwater for the full thickness. And they have also raised the armor from the middle deck to the main deck, which is a key feature of the ships. So I touched upon that a minute ago when they were talking about dropping down from, you know, 12 to 10 guns. Mm. And this is probably the defining reason for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> sorry. So it's, it's, it's interesting there because you've got this, um, by having the, the, the armor much higher, you're creating a much larger volume within your citadel, which allows you to retain buoyancy and also avoid free surface effect when you start flooding yeah. higher up yeah and they're, they're a big fan of this um and they've actually got in the ship's cover a stability curve drawn to show if the ship's riddled at the ends very damaged how stable is it if the armor deck is at the main deck compared to the middle deck and it is very different so i wish i could reproduce it because it's very striking just how much it contributes to a more stable ship in a damaged state Mm. So you can see why they like it from that respect. The initial drive, there was probably actually bombs again. They want bombs that are exploding on the armor deck to be well away from the waterline, which is not something people tend to think of too much, I don't think. But what their fear was that if the ship was for every reason already low in the water because of damage or listing or turning, and if a bomb hit the armor deck near the sea and you open up the side of the ship, then suddenly you can get flooding above your armor deck and... Clearly, that's not great for stability either. Yes. So they don't like that at all. Um, and they also like how you've got a greater distance between the deck and the magazine. So if you get any spooling coming out the bottom of the deck, it's got a long way to travel to hit anything disastrous. Um, and also gives you more area for you know, internal communications and damage control. So the ship, just in general, is a lot less vulnerable to non-penetrating hits and what's interesting here is that they know actually the ideal is to have the armor deck at upper deck level now they can't go that far that's far too much weight um but that's what they sort of think at this stage is the best solution and it's always interesting actually never get to it with capital ship designs but some of the cruiser designs you sort of wonder why they look so heavy for their displacement compared to foreign foreign contemporaries and it's because for some of them, they have started putting the main armor deck at upper deck level. I see. Which is an interesting approach, I find. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it kind of worked for some of the armored carriers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of how belt and deck uh, combine. You know, they, why they wanted the vertical and then why they lifted up the main deck so high. Mm-hmm. Then the next bit of the protection, which is worth considering, is torpedo defense. And this is always an interesting one because, as you can see, it's a relatively narrow system compared to its contemporaries, and therefore it gets quite a lot of stick sometimes. And it's fair, you know, you can't deny that its depth compared to others is quite narrow. But it was tested at full scale, and it passed the test, and it was never breached in practice, although it was never fully tested. But there's a sort of few other features I think that are worth noting about how they defend against torpedoes. And it's not just to the torpedo, the poke head, and then they stop. As you can see by this plan view at the bottom, blue are the main machinery spaces, red are your main magazines and your 5.25 inch magazines. You can see there's a gap between the torpedo bulkhead and these spaces pretty much all the way around. With the wing engine rooms, where they have to be a bit further towards the side of the ship, they have an additional holding bulkhead to try and stop any flooding coming through. So it's a compromise. Um, I think we'd all like uh, the widest possible system. But I think it's worth highlighting that just because in these ships you can get past the torpedo bulkhead, you, know, you might rupture it or you might strain it and it might flood, you're not immediately flooding your main magazines or your... Um, main machinery spaces you know if a bit of flash gets through your torpedo bulkhead it's still got to get through another compartment to endanger the ship so do you want to lose these outboard spaces i thought like, no they've 
clearly not. You know, they are useful spaces. But losing an eighth of your electricity generation is a lot less damaging than losing a quarter of your boilers or having something reach your main magazines. So I think it's always worth highlighting the design and how they've tried to maximize the protection while having a relatively narrow defense system. Which of course doesn't mean that they don't try and make that narrow defense system as good as they possibly can. You know, they do all sorts of modeled trials, they do full scale trials, um, they refine it best they can. You know, people look simply at width quite often, but there's all sorts of things that the Navy looked at when it was designing this, particularly how it supported the bulkhead. Um, you know, you look at the job 74 conclusions and it's mostly talking about how they've supported the bulkhead, what supports failed, how could they improve? Never weld these these deals because they'll fail quite quickly. Um, and it's just a lot more went into it than we need to make the system as wide as possible. Yeah, and I suppose this is the thing. The, the depth has a value of its own, but as you point out, it's the, not the sole consideration. Yeah, yeah. There's there's other ways of stopping it, and there's it's it's a, as you say, we'll, and as we'll cover later on it's it's still a system that it's a system that functions very well you're not going to find many if any uh torpedo defense systems in the run-up to world war ii that are rated against a thousand pound of explosives going off right next to it yeah um, and i think i just find it gets a lot of criticism purely based on it being thin and you still go it's still 10 to 13 feet mostly you know maximum 14 feet um you still got your out of a void compartment to let the blast dissipate. Then you've got your liquid to catch any splinters and distribute the force. You know, they leave a two foot gap at the top of that liquid layer so the liquid can go upwards to get rid of some more force. Then you've got another void compartment. And only then, if you've got the bulkhead, and in the Citadel, you know, this is framed every two feet, I think. Um, and they put a lot of thought into how this bulkhead supported. It can deflect a lot. You know, before rupturing <clears throat> when they do the job 74 tests i think you know it passed but it still deflected the best part of three feet inwards which is partly why they wanted these compartments between the torpedo bulkhead and the absolute vitals because just because your torpedo bulkhead holds doesn't mean you're not you're going to stop all the flooding or any damage at all yeah so they put a lot of you know thought into how can they maximize the underwater protection Okay, well, I suppose that that covers the the basic of the protect protective systems. Um, now, of course, there is one other treaty battleship that's originally designed with the four, fourteen inch gun in three quadruple mounts, which is what the U.S. was planning to build the North Carolinas as before they made a last minute change with the collapse of the treaty system and the in, introduction of the escalator clause. So. How do the two, how do the North Carolinas, as designed with three quad 14s, compare to the King George V's, either as designed or as built? I think it's quite interesting um, because if you go sort of far enough back in the King George V design history, you actually get ships that look very similar um, in some ways. They still got the differences. Um, obviously, you've got the three quad 14 inch, but you go back to the KG5s when they had. 24 and a half inch secondaries and you're going well they've got 24 and a half inch secondaries firing a shell of about 55 pounds and the north carolinas have 25 inch secondaries firing a shell of about 55 pounds um they're both about 27 knots this is before you get the increased speed um up to 28 for king george the so as originally designed it was 28 knots for them in the standard but they'd also then in action have about 2,000 tonnes of water in their torpedo defence system. And therefore their actual speed was about 27. One of the design changes they make later on gets rid of that water and puts fuel there instead. So they save about 2,000 knots and they can do 28 knots even when deeply loaded. Um, but so you know, at that point, you know, 27 knots, 27 knots, 12, 14 inch, 12, 14 inch. You've got 20 secondaries versus 20 secondaries. So there are, you can sort of see the similarities there. Um, but on the other hand, 
they sort of also diverge. You know, North Carolina still have the incline belt, albeit external. Um, whereas obviously by this point, the KG5s are very firmly going, will have the external belt. Um, and then as you sort of get further along, you sort of see them diverge a bit more with the heavier secondaries and the raising of the armoured deck in the King George the Fifths. So it is an interesting comparison because if you, you can take some of the 14-inch North Carolina designs and take some of the 14-inch King George V designs and go, these ships on paper look very similar. Um, but then equally, you take them to the end of their processes and they've diverged quite a lot. Yeah, I suppose that, I mean, we've, we've partly covered it, but I suppose it does also raise the follow-on question of once the escalator clause gets invoked, the U.S., takes the North Carolinas in for a quick redesign and basically swaps out quad 14s for triple 16s mm. but they don't they well don't and can't change anything else at that stage so you end up with the North Carolinas not following the general rule of thumb with battleships of being proof against their own main armament the Royal Navy doesn't it presses on with the 14 inch gun so did they think at any point of doing a similar North Carolina style swap once the escalator clause was invoked and popping 16 inch guns in instead. Um, There's a single line in the ship's cover, which references this. Um, and the answer was apparently that they did, um, but they didn't proceed with it because it would have involved a bigger ship to start with. Um, and that's it. There's just a single line. So how seriously it was considered, I'm not sure. Um, I think there was a lot of pressure on, sort of the draftsman who designed these guns at the time and just going down to the twin was a big change mm. but i expect it was briefly considered in late 35 early 36 that what they you know could they what would it require and they quickly decided that actually no it wasn't a very good idea yeah because to make this shit big enough they would have had to sacrifice something else and I suppose they're also under a little bit more time pressure because the first King George the Fifths get ordered a little bit sooner than the North Carolinas, so North Carolina has a little bit more time for them yeah. to play with the design as opposed to with the you know as you mentioned earlier, the King George the Fifths are already delayed somewhat compared to where they'd ideally like them to be in service, so holding it up at the very last minute is more of a pressure on them. Yeah, that there's just no willingness to sort of delay it any more than they have to. Um, and then you get this note when they're looking at the 1937 program ships, the second three King George the Fifth, and it's like, well, in, re in reality, we're committed to 14 inch to these ships as well, because if we don't, um, they'll be delayed by at least a year and if not 18 months, just to, you know, stick a 15 inch gun on. It'll be a new design, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, they want those ships to be up arm now the escalator clause has taken effect it will delay them yeah 18 months and they can't do that um and you have to remember that i think if i recall correctly all five king george the fifths were laid down before the first north carolina um yeah yeah and they just very, got strung out coming into service because of the war yeah it was a very rapid you know first of january the first one was laid down and by july all five were um and they, yeah, they got a bit delayed later on when some got bombed and some were paused for a bit and yeah. all that. So yeah, the pressure was on to get them in the water as soon as possible. Yeah, and I suppose that that brings us on to um, one of the big myths, misconceptions, call it what you will, with regards to the King George V and their quad turrets. Because people, some people tell you they're absolutely awful. Um, and of course, the language goes on and on and on um, left and right about with the quad turrets of you know some people say the quad turret was poor other people say the quad the gun itself was poor other people point to the the shell hoist and handling systems um all of which are actually completely different systems completely yeah. different design specs completely different levels of reliability so i mean we do know obviously um king george v 
does have some issues against uh, Bismarck in the final fight. Prince of Wales is infamous for her, her issues at Denmark Strait, perhaps unfairly so. And even Duke of York has some loss of its firepower output at the Battle of the North Cape. So what's going on? <laughs> what's the, what's yeah, the road it's out, huh? a very fair question. Um, and the first thing to say is that, yes, there absolutely were troubles with the guns at first. Um, and I always feel a bit sorry for Prince of Wales because actually, of the three, you know, King George V and Duke of York, her output over her couple of days fighting Bismarck was probably the best. Um, so you sort of bring up on this slide here, you know, overall, she actually did about 79% across three engagements. Granted, the third was a single, well, two salvos. Um, whereas King George V, while she started very strongly, you know, in the first half an hour, she fired probably 200 shells of no problems mentioned that I found. By the end of the battle, you know, she had experienced humongous problems. Um, apparently for seven minutes she was down to just two guns so you can't sort of turn around and say oh it's all problems are overblown because clearly they were there mm -hmm. um but this wasn't a surprise to the royal navy they'd had problems introducing the eight inch guns on the cruisers they had problems with the 16 inch on the nelsons it was an accepted part of introducing a new turret that there would be difficulties at first it was just the great misfortune for the King George the Fist that they had to discover these essentially in combat. Um, but I just find it's useful to get a bit of perspective. So yeah, Prince of Wales, she went in against Bismarck and she had all sorts of problems. But she probably shouldn't have been there. Um, she still had Vickers technicians on board trying to solve her issues. Uh, and compared to the peacetime standard of six months to work up the full efficiency, she'd had about three weeks. So I think with Prince of Wales, I tend to give her a bit of leeway because actually she had problems, yes, but they were not unexpected nor particularly bad compared to what they might have been. And then King George V is a very interesting one because, as I mentioned, half an hour, basically faultless output. Um, you know, her first 40 to 50 salvos, no problems worth recording. Uh, and then there were loads and there's... You know, I've thought about listing them all out, but he sort of mentioned everything to do with the guns in some description. Uh, but she still managed to fire 339 uh, in about an hour and a half. So, yeah, there were problems and it revealed them. But for that first half an hour in the most important phase, she was fine. And how many battleships do we know that fired for an hour and a half? Not many. And then with Duke of York's output, her output was actually quite poor at just 66%. But again, if you look at the first half now, you know, the first 31 broadsides, he had 91% for that time. And it's only as the battle gets on longer and longer, these other flaws start kicking in. So you sort of start thinking, well, all right, how many other ships fired 80 broadsides in an Arctic storm in rolling seas? Um, a very short list and again 446 shells in about two hours i mean those are that's a lot of <laughs> shells thrown at the enemy um and the gold standard being held up tends to be really short engagements i think i think i'm thinking of Saragau Strait, and you've got a engagement that lasts about 10 minutes and duke of york fires more shells at scharnhorst than the entire american battle line does and I just find it's not really a like for like comparison, is it? No. And you know, a nice calm Pacific evening versus a single ship in an Arctic storm rolling extravagantly. Yeah. And and a lot I, I think that's that also also bears out in as you've done looking through all the records, uh an an awful lot of the issues that crop up are not the guns jammed. It's not even necessarily that the shell hoist jammed, although we'll come on to that in a second. A lot of it is just error in drill, i.e. Yeah. if you're in a 35,000 ton steel can being chucked around the Arctic Ocean and you're being asked to manhandle a shell that weighs as much as a small car, 
shockingly enough, occasionally you're not going to get it 100% right, and they they want to sh- send those shells down range, so they're not going to sit there and go, well, yeah, you know what, guys, we're going to delay our salvo by five to ten seconds while you sort yourselves out. They're just going to go, okay, we'll fire with three guns this time. And yeah. then that goes yeah, down yeah. as error and drill, missed, missed salvo. Yeah, and so those often don't, you know, don't mention them. They just fire, you know, four guns fired, not five. No, there's no error. It just took a bit longer for one crew to load, maybe because they had to get a shell from the bottom of the shell bin because it was nearly empty or something. Mm. Um, you know, I think it's easy to assume that these things are all automated mechanical perfection and not people having to grab shells from the back of tight compartments that are rolling about mm. and then feed them up into these machines. So I think that's always worth bearing in mind. Um, and then in practice firings, I actually came across a couple of documents in the last week which had the results of some practice firings. You know, the highly regarded 15-inch twin, what we think of being exceptionally reliable, probably averaged about 90% output in the piece 1930s. And then you look at the 14-inch and go, well, between 1942 and 1944, it did about 16 um, practice firings. 96.1% output. So if it's doing better during you know, wartime exercises than the 15-inch twin ice under peace conditions, is it that unreliable? Or are the guns just not tested the same way? Yeah. And I suppose it's in, in some ways, you know, like you say, Vickers technicians on Prince of Wales, it's still, it, it basically hasn't had a sh- proper shakedown cruise yet. So in a lot of ways, it would be kind of, it'd be like, say, again, looking at the North Carolinas because they're, uh, the sort of the comparable ships, it'd be like taking a North Carolina fresh out of the shipyard and then trying to chase down something like Bismarck in the North Sea, and then everyone ragging on at it because you know the propellers don't really work and, yeah. the, and the backs fishtailing and vibrating, and all of a sudden the poor thing's stuck down at twenty four, twenty five knots, and then it forever being tainted as the ship with the terrible engines when it's actually yeah. a shakedown cruise problem, which that's what shakedown cruises are for. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, needs must. And it's better to have a ship that can fire most of its armor most of the time than it is to let an enemy battleship romp amongst your trade routes. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing to mention is, of course, as we mentioned at the start of this particular question, the shell hoist system, the guns, and the turrets themselves are all are three very independent systems. And one of the other, apart from errors and drill, one of the other issues they have is that, you know, the guns work. The turrets work, but the shell hoist system is actually working too well because they've made it so flash tight, they've made the tolerances so close that the ship, just the ship flexing as it proceeds at high speed in moderate to rough swells, that little flex is just enough to cause little jams and and and, and just small delays and snags, which again can cripple your ability to get shells up to the, t- the turrets fast enough so in, weirdly enough they've done one part too well which is resulting in problems elsewhere and as i understand it sort of mid-war someone i think they just turned around and said yeah, guys you can you can back off slightly on the like one thirty second of an inch tolerances um and suddenly all of, as you mentioned with the test firings in the mid to late war period all of a sudden the the reliability level goes way 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 up yeah, um, uh, and it does, and the tolerances are a thing. You know, they, the handbook for the 14-inch mount says they allowed one inch. Um, I think it's been suggested that one inch might not have been enough in the worst seas, um, which I can quite understand. Here I've noted down a couple of faults on this slide, just as an example. Um, I couldn't tell you what the number 11 interlock was, so I'm not going to get too much detail there. Uh, but just to give you an idea that these... The faults that happened most of the time were relatively minor. Um, the problem was they kept reoccurring. So you look at King George's fishing, you know, a gun might jam, they might clear it, it would happen a bit later because the rammers were too tight or too worn or whatever. Um, the big failures were probably with the shell ring on occasion, when while it's a great idea in theory, or when it's working, because you can ensure a steady supply of ammunition, if it gets buckled at all, suddenly it doesn't rotate, and then you're not getting any shells into the ammunition feed system. 
Um, and this struck Prince of Wales quite famously mm. in that as she turned to dodge Hood's wreckage, um, one of the shells in the shell rooms slid and it fouled um, the shell ring that was sort of rotating with the turret. And so that basically jammed the entire system. Uh, bit of a problem. Took a few hours to clear that. Likewise, you look at Duke of York and her issue wasn't the shell ring itself getting jammed, but one of the main things was that the shell arresters failed. So as you sort of ram a shell into the system, you've got these sort of arresters to keep it in place to stop it going too far. Now, unfortunately, what happened in Duke of York's case is obviously being in a storm, they were being very careful but at one point, as the ship suddenly lurched, that happened just as they were trying to ram the shells in. And the arresters couldn't take the force, so they collapsed. And then, for, so for three of her four guns in the Y turret, um, the shells surged right past the stops and jammed the loading system. And it only took about 15 minutes to clear. But for that 15 minutes, they fired 17 salvos or broadsides. Um, and that, that's about a quarter of Duke of York's entire missed output at North Cape. That only happened because of the weather. And some spectacularly bad timing. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, the, clearly the fourth gun was all right because they had slightly timed it differently. You know, maybe they're a bit faster, a bit slow. But that gun stayed in action. Um, so, you know, it's, it's these sort of things. If you step away, if you take the weather out a bit, a large number, not all, I don't want to give the wrong impression, but a large number of the faults, particularly of those in Duke of York, disappear. Um, and the rest is just what you might expect if you fired 60 salvos in an hour. Things are going to start breaking. Um, there's a lot of force going through these. So, you know, another fault that happened in Duke of York was a washer. Basically, it just fractured. And so the lubricating tank kit was on leak and they had to top that up. You know, these are little things that you can't be surprised that happen after 40, 50, 60 shots. Um, but they do cause you to miss salvo, so they go down in the book, and you're then looking at the sentries at the end of the battle going, hang on a minute. It's all well and good if Matt sits there and says in peacetime fires they got 96%, but in the middle of that, they went to fight and got 66. What's going on? Um, and it's just long battles. But overall, the Royal Navy was quite happy with the turrets. Um, you know, they, they acknowledge the problems, but they go, you know, modifications to overcome the weaknesses revealed have since been carried out, and the prospects of these turrets soon becoming thoroughly reliable appear to be good. Uh, Duke of York's gunnery action report, the 14-inch mountings behaved very satisfactorily on the whole. All guns and mountings were in action at the time Scarn or sank after very considerable and credible exertion on the part of the ordnance staff and clearing several very awkward jams. So you look at that and go, well, if the Royal Navy, who has quite a lot of experience with heavy gun turrets, thinks that actually they're not that bad, you know, it doesn't necessarily gel with what you hear today about how rubbish and unreliable they were. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important to to get that get that straight because as we've said, you know, there's there's all sorts of myths and legends going around about the ship, and it it doesn't help discussion when people stick to you know tired old tropes that aren't actually in any way accurate. But I suppose that does bring us on to one of the other <laughs> big misconceptions about the class when poor old Prince of Wales ends up meeting its demise at the hands of uh, the Japanese torpedo bombers. Um, does that loss indicate either a major failing or failings with the design of the ship itself um, as as a battleship as opposed to, you know, a ship that's just having large amounts of explosives chucked at it? Yeah, and it's an interesting question because I think lots depends on how you define major failings because there, there were some major failings. The question is... To me, would other ships have done any better? I'm not entirely convinced they would have done, but I don't know enough about them to say for sure. Um, and of course, there were improvements made afterwards. You know, no ship is perfect, and 
every time you lose one, you learn lessons. I think there's a couple of myths, though, about the ship that and Prince of Wales has lost that I would like to sort of stamp on when I get the chance. Um, and that is that the anti-aircraft fire was rubbish. I mean, yeah, there were some jams in the pom-poms. I think you know, that's on record. You can't get around that. Um, it is noted in one of the reports I read that they may not have been cleaned as well as they should have done. And that contributed. Of course, that might just be people back in the UK trying to protect themselves when they've just lost a brand new battleship. Um, but this quote here from the Japanese official history, which says, you know, even when Prince of Wales was down to six knots and sinking, and she had about three of her 5.25 inch guns still in action, it was still extremely fierce. And five of the eight aircraft in one particular attack were hit. Um, you can't boil everything down to how many aircraft did you completely shoot down? Um, there's more to it than that. I think you have to remember that Prince of Wales was hit ridiculously early on. Um, she didn't really get a chance to show everything she was capable of doing. Because in the first uh, torpedo attack, you know, she lost half her power. Which brings us on to the other kind of myth. A torpedo defense system was rubbish. Um, and I just sort of like to point out that she took four torpedo hits. Only one of those was on her torpedo defense system. That did not breach it. It held successfully. Um, above it, there was some damage because by this point, the system had been counter flooded. And so all the force went upwards into the wash places for the crew. Um, but the actual torpedo bulkhead itself held. There was no flooding in board of that, which is expected because, you know, they were aerial torpedoes, not anywhere near um, what the ship had been designed to take. But where this myth has come about is that for many, many years, it was thought that she had taken five torpedo hits, one of which was about midship's port abreast the forward engine rooms. We now know, having looked at the wreck, that this hit never happened, and this was flooding from the hit right aft, spreading along the shaft alley. Um, but it did mean for decades we had people trying to work out how a system designed for a thousand pound warhead failed to a 405 pound warhead or whatever that hit was meant to be. And the answer is, well, it didn't fail. So there's nothing really to answer there. Mm -hmm. As for the crippling damage the ship did suffer, it's hard to say if a different design would have done any better. Um, just because there's not been any research that I've seen into how that could have been minimized um, or sort of prevented. So what happened is that the torpedo struck the hull near where the outer port shaft exited the hull. Um, so this had sort of two negative effects. One, it was mostly below the hull rather than next to it. So the force of that explosion tried to lift up the stern. Um, but obviously why turret is one and a half thousand tons isn't going anywhere. So you've got a sort of a whiplash motion through the ship, um, which broke a lot of the electrical circuits. The other factor is that it essentially blew away the shaft strut that held the shaft in line. Obviously the shaft was still turning. It was now, however, no longer turning centrally and it was oscillating, which had the very unfortunate effect of damaging the watertight integrity along half the ship's length. If you look at these plans here, the red areas shows you the extent of the flooding from this one hit and how they spread, you know, from a hit right aft all the way into the heart of the ship. Um, clearly very undesirable. And so it's one of those hits that I don't know how you protect against it, essentially. Um, you know, when you've got a shaft that runs half length of the ship spinning out of centre, that's going to damage uh, any ship. Would a skeg have helped? You know, would that have stopped the shaft rotating if it was hit? It might have done. But it also it might have transferred more force into the shaft and made it worse. We just don't know. Um, so I ha it's hard to hold or, or see an obvious why didn't they do this? Um, because it's just such an unlucky hit. 
Yeah, I mean, the only the only similar case I can think of was when Vittoria Veneto was torpedoed by swordfish in the Mediterranean. Not quite the same, but almost the same hit. And yeah. in actual fact, she basically came to a dead stop, which um, Prince of Wales didn't do initially. Actually, kept going. Um, but the difference there being that although although Prince of Wales didn't come to a dead stop immediately, she was slowed. And she was subjected to continued repeated torpedo attack thereafter, which obviously you know, opened more holes in the ship. Whereas Vittoria Veneto gets hit by a torpedo at the tail end of a torpedo strike, and she's able to sit there in, if it's dead in the water or operating at extremely slow speed, and make good all the damage in a relatively calm and controlled manner before then gradually picking up speed and motoring off because she's not under continuous attack. So. I suppose on the one hand, it's it's a similar on the surface attack, but with very different circumstances, which kind of makes it not quite applicable. But at the same time, the initial circumstance of the attack of this sort of torpedo hit in the propul in the stern around the propellers, it does show that you know it's not just the King George V that are vulnerable to this kind of strike. Yeah, it's hard to think of any ship that wouldn't be seriously inconvenienced at the very least by this sort of hit. Mm. Um, and I think opinion varies whether or not to this one hit alone was fatal. Um, some people think, you know, this hit was, that that was it. You know, everything else was sort of immaterial. Um, there was enough flooding, enough damage here uh, to see the ship sunk. Others think that it wasn't. She might have been saved had she just had this torpedo hit and that was it. She might be able to limp back to Singapore. Um, had the crew, A, be able to shut off the engines not worried about further attack um, and be, be able to put their full efforts into damage control, you know, maybe they could have stopped the flooding sufficiently. Uh, obviously, the problem was is that the ship was still under attack and when, from the point of view of those in the engine room, there was no reason to stop the shaft. But so they sort of, they stopped it and went, what, you know, doesn't seem to be any damage to it, so we'll start it again. And you spin it up to 20 plus knots. And then you do yet more damage. Um, but it's impossible to sort of know that when you're the one making decision in the engine room. Um, and also you've got the follow-on torpedo hits, particularly the one right aft on the starboard side that essentially goes, well, you've made all these efforts to establish the flooding boundary. Bam, gone. Um, completely destroyed. So... I'm not sure, to be honest, if I think that first hit was fatal. Uh, I think it was very unlucky because it did essentially take out half her electricity generation. It snapped, you know, her entire half ring main failed. And now you can probably argue that that's a major failing. But again, whether or not you could have done anything to mitigate this particular hit, I'm not sure it can be yeah. answered for sure. I, I suppose... It... I've generally taken the view of it's given the circumstances, given how many torpedo bombers were around there and they were coming back for more. I've always tended to view it as a kind of in and of itself, probably not fatal. It just in, in isolation, but also, also a fatal hitting context in much the same way as kind of like, you know, if you're running away from a medieval battlefield if someone shoots you in the leg with an arrow, tears to your hamstring, probably not going to kill you, but it slowed you down to the point that the cavalry coming up behind you definitely will kill you. So, it, not yeah. not strictly fatal, but very definitely a, a somewhat important contributory factor to what happens to you in the end. Yeah, and when, when that takes out half your anti-aircraft armor as well, yeah. you are really up the creek without a paddle. Um you know, as the other quote said, you know, she never really got a chance to show what she could do because the first hit took out half her armament. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, yes, you can always improve, you know, parts of the design. But whether or not you could have mitigated against that kind of explosion or damage, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they learned plenty of lessons from it. Um, you know, I've named a few here. You know, from the cable routes to the 5.25 inch mountings, more watertight bulkheads after than the crew wash places, 
side scuttles getting blanked, more watertight doors um, getting blanked off. They extended the pumping system in later ships. Um, they removed the ship's lining so they could do damage control easier. They added battery feed to emergency lights instead of oil, duplicated some power leads. Sleeping accommodation that was below the waterline got moved higher on the ship. Um, they put a provision room aft, which I always found interesting, that they hadn't done that from the start. But yeah, as designed, all the food was kept forward. So if mm. you were damaged there, you went hungry. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's always improvements to these ships. And I would never want to give the impression that I think these ships are wonderfully perfect. Um, yeah. But I just think you need to be very aware of where they failed and what caused it and how typical was it. Yeah. Yeah, which is fair enough. Yeah, because no, no, yeah, no ship is perfect. Every ship is a design compromise, especially the treaty ships. But even the ones that were built not restricted by treaty are still limited by things like size of dockyard infrastructure and how much money do you want to spend on on it? Because um, I'm sure you can build the perfect battleship if you want to use your country's entire GDP. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I so suppose that leads us on. So we've covered some of the more famous stuff, you know. Prince of Wales and King George V versus Bismarck, Prince of Wales at and Four Z, um, Shan Horse versus Duke of York. What did the ships spend the rest of the war doing? Because very few people even realise that Anson and Howe even existed, <laughs> let alone that they did anything. But obviously King George V didn't just go into quiet retirement after Bismarck was sunk, nor did Duke of York do that when it's after it's had sunk Shan Horse. So what else are they doing? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's not particularly dramatic, at least particularly compared to things like the Bismarck action or North Cape, um, but it's very necessary. <clears throat> so Anson and Howe are commissioned in 1942, and they mostly spend their times up in Scarpa Flow, keeping an eye on the Germans in Norway, um, covering Arctic convoys and just making sure that those ships up north that the Germans have aren't a threat to either the Arctic supply lines or the North Atlantic supply lines. Um, and it does involve a lot of steaming around, not actually firing at anything. Um, in 1943, they do a bit more um, sunnier stuff when a couple of them, King George V herself and Howe, go to the Mediterranean. Um, they spend a few months there to cover against the Italians. Um, sorting against the British or the Allied landings in Sicily and then Italy itself. But they never actually see much action. And then the American ships that have sort of been moved to Scarpa Flow to cover for them have to go back to the United States so they get taken back up north because you've got Turpit still and Charm Horse, a couple of the heavy cruisers. And so they want to have two or three ships around just to be sure. So it's not, yeah dramatic or exciting but it's very necessary and then mostly by the time you get to early 1944 you're looking towards the far east um, and the pacific and so they take them to at a time for modernization for service out east which the well-known get rid of the catapult give them lots of anti-aircraft guns then give them a few more anti-aircraft guns just to be sure uh, and then you also get the ventilation discussions, which I find very amusing because there's lots of criticism made at the time and since that the ventilation of the, the air within the ships was rubbish. And then you've got the designer's responses going, we have given these ships more ventilation than any ship we've ever built in the history of Britain. There is no, no we can't do any more. It's got 50% more than any other ship. What are you expecting? And I'm particularly amused that when they point to Renown, who had been out there, and they go, look, you've got more ventilation than Renown. Renown's not complaining. <laughs> not anything from her. So um, get on with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I suppose there's, there's, there's only... The operation through decades is quite entertaining. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, especially with the 1940s technology, if you're in the middle of the Western Pacific in the... It's sort of between the tropics, there is only a lim there is a limit to how much the technology can do. Is if it's if it's thirty five plus degrees out outside, you know, short of going and standing in the ship's refrigerator, 
it's 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 hot everywhere. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> um, but it was just a problem that came up again and again throughout their service lives, and they did try to address it. Um, and obviously, we can't judge from this distance if they were successful, but they made an effort. Hmm. So, I suppose that then all leads on to the questions. You know, we've talked about some of the the myths and misconceptions, some of the reasons why some of the design choices were made. But given all of that, what design features do you think could reasonably have been changed for the better? Maybe things they they might have seen if they if they'd given them a second pass. And conversely, what features do you think of the ships were outstanding and and sort of pretty much top of their class? It's an interesting one because like, yeah, you want to sort of stay away from these questions with like, oh, give them bigger guns because that's mm. a easy and b impossible. But mm. <laughs> there are things that you look at and go, yeah, if you were starting again or, or looking at it again, what would you change? Um, and one of the things that springs to mind the, the comments on the ship's wetness. Now I've got a couple of tables here, and that show that actually freeboard wise, midships, the class was absolutely fine compared to their contemporaries. You know, they don't look bad in terms of freeboard for most of their length. But what they don't have is very much sheer forward. Um, they do have some, contrary to what some people tell you. Only about five feet though. Uh, so they are wet forward, and this is particularly so as the war goes on and they get heavier and heavier. <clears throat> You know, they're designed to be a, a deep displacement of 41,000 tonnes. Um, and in 1945, they're at about 45,000 tonnes. So they sit lower, they're wetter. Um, as built, they're not too bad. Um, one of the constructors goes on King George V's trial and says, actually, it was fine. You know, the breakwaters did what their job was. But I think in hindsight, you can say there's a good argument that you would have given a vanguard S shear to their bow. Um mm -hmm requirements to shoot at low elevations forward never actually happened and by the time you got anywhere you know you had radar coming into the war and suddenly the situations where you might need to do that kind of low elevation firing directly forward were basically gone um, and that would have been a fairly straightforward thing to do so I think that's sort of definitely up there on my list um, turret armour Barbet armor, I think you could make a case should have been improved. Mm -hmm. They do have quite thin turret faces. Um, interestingly enough, they are vertical to increase their protection. Um, this is, when they were first looking at new turret designs in about 1933, the sketches all sort of showed a Nelson S turret shape. And they went, well, that's all right. Um, but we think that a vertical face will be better than having one sort of sloped away from the incoming shell, for obvious reasons. Um, and so that's why you get the vertical thing. It is a protection feature, not a... We just felt like having vertical faces for X, Y, or Z. Um, yeah. But it, even so, it is still 13 inches. Uh, likewise, barbettes are maximum of 13 inches. So if you hit, were hit flush on the barbette, um, that could be a problem at certain ranges. So I don't think it would have cost too much to increase that. You know, it would have, I'm not saying it's not significant, it would several hundred tons, but that compared to their belt armor and deck armor, it stands out a bit that the main armor, if hit directly, was perhaps more vulnerable than others. Whether or not if you take a direct hit to the turret, it actually matters um, too much. You know, the shock might jolt the mounting and jam it, put it out of action. Who knows? But that's something I thought that, you know, if I was to go back, I might try and add an extra inch to it. Um, and interesting enough, that does come up in the lions. You see the lions have 15-inch barbettes and 15-inch turret faces. So it, that's something the Royal Navy does see as a worthwhile improvement. Um, and then finally, I would say endurance could be improved. Um, but the myth here I want to step on is that it's not because their engines were inefficient, it's more they just had small fuel tanks. So it's always fun to bring out this particular graph because the red line is the drastically inefficient, so it goes King George V based on war experience, and that blue line is the North Carolinas, one of those wonderfully efficient 
engine ships. And as you can see, after you get to about 23 knots, um, your North Carolina is using a lot more fuel than the King George V. Um, but obviously the North Carolina still has a lot more endurance because it has much bigger fuel tanks. Uh, you know, the King George V are similar to the Latorios in practice, which isn't very much um, compared to something like Bismarck or North Carolina or Richelieu even. Um, so I think you could add a few hundred tons of fuel, give her an extra thousand miles of endurance, and probably the reputation goes away. Because it only really comes up in the Bismarck chase, it's a humongous flaw. Everything else is workable. Um, and you know, if you say King George V would have had an extra thousand miles in the tank on the 27th of May against Bismarck, well, this whole, maybe we'll have to tow her back never needs to be said in that you don't get that same reputation. So, yeah, I think giving them a bit more fuel would have been a good idea. Fair enough. Uh, obviously, it has its costs, you know, mm. regarding overall displacement and whole weight, but I do think it is useful, particularly when you realise they spent the end of the war trouncing around the Pacific for endless weeks. Um, bigger fuel tanks would have been an improvement that could have been made at the design stage. As for strength, um, I do like the high armoured deck. I think that's important. Um, I don't think that gets enough appreciation either. It's not an obvious thing if you just look in a book, necessarily. But I think it's protection against bombs, it's additional stability, um, would have been very valuable in don't say the right circumstances because they would have been really bad for the ship, but you know what I mean. Uh, if the ship came under heavy punishment, I think the high armor deck would have proved its worth. Um, I also do like their general sort of setup um, with the secondary armament. I think it's a strength. I, I like having the four separate batteries almost in the secondary armament. Mm -hmm. They did set up the fire control that you could sort of fire each side from either forward or aft fire control positions. Each position also had both a anti-aircraft fire control computer and an anti-surface one. So you could be sort of as flexible as you wished. And, you know, it was brought up in sort of war experience documents saying the ability to deal with four aircraft at once was very useful. And we'll try and extend that to as many ships as possible in the future. Um, so I like how you've got your four distinct secondary batteries in that four corner arrangement. Unlike many, I do like that they put serious thought into aircraft. I didn't, it is again, one of those features that in hindsight you could have done away with, um, but they weren't to know that in 1936. And I think you look at the theoretical hitting rates, at least that air spotting provided and you go, well, if you did get into that kind of battle in an alternate universe, it would have been very useful for the ship to have had its own spotting aircraft. Um, likewise for reconnaissance in slightly better conditions, having reconnaissance to try and track down something like Bismarck would have been useful. Um, so I like the aircraft. I see why people don't. And also even the Navy at the time was saying, do we really need aircraft? Um, and I think probably one of the big changes that would have happened um, after the lines that were laid down, you know, the sort of the evolved successor lines, mm -hmm. I they would have lost their aircraft facilities quite quickly. Um, because even for the King George V, they were going, we don't necessarily want them on the ship. And now the London Naval Treaty isn't limiting how many carriers we can have. Um, in the long term, we won't need them on the ships. But in the short term, we need to still build new carriers. So we do need them on the ships. Uh, so that's an interesting feature, I find. Okay. Well, with all of that said, how do we think, in the round, do you think the KGVs are stacking up considered alongside other contemporary battleships? And obviously we are talking about contemporaries, not ships that were designed half a decade or more after they were they were put in service. Um. It's an interesting one because 
you can look at, I look at all of them, of these sort of so-called 35,000 mm. tonners, oh. um, none of which actually were that low, but that's another story. Um, mm. And I like bits of all of them. Um, I think they're all, in their own way, solid designs. And it just depends what you prioritize most. So, and again, things like Richelieu never got the chance to show really what they could do. I think they're quite an efficient design. I think you get a lot of fighting power for your tonnage compared to, say, looking at a Littorio or a Bismarck in particular. Um, I think, you know, that, that you can't get away from the fact that they've got smaller guns than the others. Um, I think in hindsight, that clearly didn't matter. The 14-inch was more than sufficient for whatever it was called upon to do. But when you sort of do a like-for-like -like comparison, um, it is a factor. Granted, look at this table, it's um, not necessarily as one-sided as it may seem. They've got a big bursting charge in their shells. They've got a reasonable amount of both belt and deck penetration. And in terms of broadside weight, actually they're higher than the Bismarck and the Richelieu's. So there is more than just calibre. Mm. Speed-wise, again, they're not the fastest, but I don't look at them and wish they necessarily had had more speed. Um, you know, 28, 29 knots as built was very respectable. And the extra knot or two some of their contemporaries had, I mean, it's nice, but it's not decisive. Uh, and then you just sort of look at armour, and then there's so many different approaches to how you protect a battleship. It's hard to sort of say any one in particular is right or wrong. Um, I do like the fact that they've got, as I mentioned before, the high armour deck. Um, I think that's strong. I think they've got a nice thick armour deck as well. Some of the other ships, I think, are not as thick as I would like. Um, and I, I am a fan of the external belt. I mean, it would be nice if you could incline it, and it should be pointed out that we think of it as vertical, but it does follow the whole contours. Mm -hmm. So it actually, for half of its length, it is slightly inclined. Um, and the breast-wide turret at points, it's nearly 15 degrees. So, you know, a 15-inch belt at 15 degrees in that particular spot is quite handy but yeah i just i think they're a solid design that they're, they're well rounded um i think they're well protected and they were there when they needed to be there and that's you know the most important thing fair enough and i suppose that that wraps up all our questions for today <laughs> um i know there is a bit more information um that we could go into you know talking about more details of the 14 inch gun and the the choice of shells and such like um so if you'd be happy to come back we could uh do a bit of a deep dive into the the gun the guns themselves and you know the big hitting sticks <laughs> as i like to call them sometimes of the ship um I, I'm fairly sure there's a lot of people who want to know a nice in-depth detail breakdown of uh, various naval naval guns, and we might as well start with the uh, King George V, since um, there's probably just as many uh, misconceptions about the guns themselves as there are about the rest of the ships. Yes, I suspect there are. Um, and from my point, I just wanted to finish with this slide, mm -hmm. just because it, I found a couple of quotes in the files that amused me. Uh, and the first was, you know, this was a paper written in 1940 going, in any case, um, the Admiral Board preferred a well-balanced ship and were not deterred by a slight disadvantage in gun calibre, any more than their forefathers were deterred from fighting and winning their battles against Frenchmen, who in general had more powerful ships. <laughs> uh, so, so that's, I admit, amused me. Um, even when the French are our allies, they're still, still poking fun at them. <laughs> And it also gets to the heart of the ship's design, right? You know, with the smaller calibre. Mm. Um, and then the, with reference to the slightly slower pace of the US ships and having the time to, you know, up gun them to 16 inch and build more and test them before they had to throw them in. You know, the USA, not having any real need for a navy, was able to wait in the critical years when we had to lay down 14 inch ships or nothing at all. Um, and I, again, that just... <laughs> The idea that the USA had no real need for a Navy uh, was an interesting take. Yes. 
as far as as uh, someone someone probably somewhat dedicated to the concept of empire had added up how many colonies the UK had versus how many colonies the US had and concluded yeah. that clearly the US had no absolutely no need for a navy because they had no colonies to maintain. Continent with no colonies, there were an island of lots. Mm. Who needs a navy more? <laughs> Oh well, well, it was a, a great pleasure uh, speaking to you, and thank you very much for sharing those the insights. And of course, um, as people can see with the slides that have gone up, you'll notice on the, uh, quite a number of them there's little reference numbers, ADM dash whatever, etc. So for those of you who are not aware, those are references to the original Admiralty document files, which. If you happen to be in the UK, you can go down to the Q National Archives and and have a look. Or if you're not in the UK, or to be honest, if you're not in London um, and you don't want to go into London, which I can understand to a certain degree, then um, nowadays the National Archives have actually reopened their digital um, download and scanning service. So if there's anything in particular you want, wherever you are, admittedly they do charge for the service, but you can get those documents scanned and sent to you. So you can have a look over all those wonderful details and try and decipher 1940 ship ship designer handwriting when they sketch random notes in this on on the sides which is um fun at times <laughs> so yeah um we'll wrap up there thank you very much everyone for listening watching whatever it is you happen to be doing and see you again in another video bye bye that's it for this video Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.